I'd like to um, invite all of our panelists back onto the stage, figuratively speaking, as all um, language of travel has become figurative in the pandemic. Um, and I would also just like to encourage all of us to take a collective moment um, as we sort of move from the reading into the Q&A and the panel to thank all of you so much for all of your, um, just what I always kind of regard as gifts, right? Um, these things that you have given to us of value um, that we are receiving. So. Uh, thank you so much for all of your words, all of your language, all of your thought. Um, we're going to move into sort of like the panel uh, Q&A format. So if anybody has questions, um, please feel free to post those in the chat. You can also use the Q&A function if you'd like. Both of these should be in the bottom bar of your Zoom um, window. I think to, to start things off, I have a, a particular question. Um, and I think that this will be sort of Kind of address broadly to the panel. Um, I think when you're working with with such a, a strong group of writers, um, that trying to find something that everyone can speak to can be challenging, right? Um, I think one of the things that uh, is fortunate for us as human beings is that we all have families, right? And that um, oftentimes there are things that happened in our childhoods that, like, maybe we need to process a little bit, or things that are happening as we get older. Um, that can sort of provide, um, you know, a source of material, right? Especially for somebody who is writing, um, viewing writing as this way of processing, right? Um, there's been some some trauma, there's been some grief, there's been some work that's been taking place emotionally. Um, but what I'm curious to kind of hear from from all of your perspectives is sort of like how um, this this tension or space of the family um, might translate into sort of the craft or the form of your work, right? Um, I think that all of you are kind of working within these genres that, or working across genres that maybe push at each other a little bit, right? Um, like even Sandra and, and Haley are sort of working in these spaces where, um, you know, they're, there's sort of tension from like maybe literary circles or there's ways that there's um, generic expectations that are being manipulated, right? Around relationships that are being formed. Um, and so I'm kind of curious to hear um, maybe from your perspective, from a, from a craft area, right? Or if you wanna to speak to just sort of what it's like to work um, with that family material as a family member, um, how that might be pushing up against the form that you're working in and pushing that piece itself further. Um, really just kind of what your process was in, in working with that material and how this sort of tension moves between sort of craft on one hand and then emotional processing on the other. I can take a stab at it. Um, you know, I write commercial fiction and, and it's genre fiction. So there's prescribed things that I'm supposed to do for my readers and I do, but what you're saying is still there. And um, I, I know, you know, if you read uh, writers who have a lot of books written and you keep reading them over and over again, you find that they are recycling and recycling and recycling the same personal issues, even when they're writing fantasy fiction or, or uh, and, and, and there is this core in you as a writer. I mean, even though one book takes place in 1930 and the next place takes place in the future in, on Mars, you're still working at these, uh, you, you called them family, but, uh, but I think of just interpersonal, just the whole yeah. idea of your notion of yourself and your relationship, uh, relationships to other people. Do people find that, that you kind of recycling material uh, feelings? Yeah, I'll maybe respond briefly as the sort of moderator here. I know that Zoom is challenging too, in terms of our pacing of a, a panel. So we'll expect some sort of short pauses in between. Um, I also really give liberty and encouragement for anyone to interrupt me um, at any time, even right now. Uh, yeah, I can, I don't know, I can go next as far as what the original question was, unless there's one. I'm sorry, unless you wanted to go, Carol. Uh, no, 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 Oscar, I'll go after you. All right. Uh, I guess what I would say, in sort of in response to Jake's question, is um, having uh, been through an MFA and 
probably having heard a lot of the same feedback that anyone who's sat in writing workshops, uh, especially with strangers, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of stuff that does in terms of feedback and kind of what uh, Hallie was talking about, the kinds of things you're encouraged to do getting recycled. And for me, um, part of writing with and about my family, um, because the pieces that I produced were also fairly collaborative and that they featured, you know, dialogue from that I've that I'd had with my folks um, is also kind of a reminder of the found my found personal foundations for storytelling um, that uh, I think, especially if you are a someone from a working class, you know, non-traditional academic background, there is this tendency to believe that, you know, I come to the page without a tradition of writing or without a tradition of storytelling or that, right, that, that I, because my folks don't have doctorates or MFAs or, you know, aren't themselves published writers, when in fact, like, and I'm sure if we all reflected on it, it's like, oh no, like my dad's great at telling stories. He grew up, you know, like my, my mom is great at, you know, relating these things. My, I'm my cousins, but I'm related to a community of storytellers and joke tellers and all that stuff. And so for me, part of reflecting on that and trying to incorporate and bridge it to the other types of writing that I do do is kind of, you know, that's what, that is what feels sort of comfortable and also challenging at the same time, um, because there's all that stuff there. And when we think about, when I think about my readers or who I want to read my stuff, you know, I kind of, part of me was like, oh, you'll get this, right? Like we all, we've had, there's some of this is familiar, but some of this will also not be necessarily right. Cause I, I, I think that's, that's what all reading is, right? Um, there's an, there's a reader who is immediately going to recognize what you're talking about. And then there's some who are like, okay, this is a bit of a challenge, but I find it rewarding to keep going. Um, so that is kind of part and parcel with the way I, I, I reflect and think about writing with and about a uh, family. Mm-hmm. Carol, I know your dog is really cute and active. Uh, did you want to respond? Yeah. I mean, I have limited it to only one dog in the room today. So I that I really thought that would calm this down. It's the time of night. Um, yeah, I think I might like say a couple of craft things, then hopefully circle into something a little more personal. Um, because this is something that definitely I um, like not struggle with, but certainly like I, I deal with every time I write. You know, and there's that old Flannery O'Connor quote that, you know, something, I'm paraphrasing, but something along the lines of, which goes, um, you know, anyone who's ever lived to age seven or eight has enough material to last themselves a lifetime as a writer. And if you've survived your childhood, like you have enough material to, to write for a lifetime. And I think that there is some truth in that. I, I also think that there's a sense of moving a little bit, I've noticed at least, um, from back when I was in school and I got an MFA and I studied literature a hundred years ago as well. Um, you know, the focus was the hero's journey, right? It was this usually a male, but always like a hero. He left home. He went out on a quest in the world. He encountered a mentor. Um, And that didn't really reflect my experience or the experience of like the books I read, the people I knew, which was they navigated social structures and domestic worlds, domestic problems, whether these were, whether it's a thriller, whether it's a romance, whether it's family trauma, generational trauma, um, discrimination, just navigating social structures in cities. I mean, they often say like mystery novels today are like the true like social novels of today because they have to deal with social issues. I noticed that like we're, we're less about the quest and we're more about the domestic and the domestic is, is the family and the social. So I guess that's like my larger point is I think that we're all wrestling with interactivity with others. Um, as Hallie had said. And I think in my own work, um, you know, I often wonder how do you tell a story that's not entirely your own? If you have many siblings, you grow up in a family, everyone has their own version of childhood. If, you know, how do you tell a story? Um, If you grew up in our culture, you've heard a lot of stories in the canon from the traditional culture, but your story might be somewhat different. So I guess there's the sense of family is like, how can you raise your voice, but then how can your voice not be like 
just a mono narrative? How can you integrate that? How can there be like multiple narratives within a story? And I'm curious about how to do that. I'm looking at like collage forms and non-traditional ways of writing to see like, how can you tell a story that's just not one voice, one story, one hero's journey? Is that a totally off the wall rant or does any of that make sense? I mean, one of the <laughs> ways, was there somebody, um, did somebody want to respond to that? I had a response, but um, I also know that Pam has maybe been making some great comments in the in the chat that I would just like to point to as well. And Pam, if you'd like the opportunity to speak, I'm actually going to um, give you the opportunity if you wanted to comment on that as, as somebody in the audience, you're not obliged to. Um, but I'm so, did one of, so some of the comments Pam has made about kind of storytelling happening everywhere and education not being required, right? Which I think also is speaking to some of the things that Oscar and Carol and even, and even Hallie kind of referenced to and kind of the, the ways that the academy um, ex exercises a kind of monopoly over uh, credibility, right? The way that the sort of um, dictates what is legitimate and what isn't, right? And how that's often coming from a very specific place. Cool, Pam is gonna let her words stay muted in the chat. So um, that is where we will be. Um, uh, Jake, I could jump in and say a couple things. Please, yeah. So um, I'm a recovered attorney and I came to creative writing very late in life. I would say just a, a dozen years ago. Um, and so, and I don't have an MFA, but I've um, um, kind of taken lots of workshop and classes through writing centers um, originally in Denver. And um, my writing journey has been um, um, progressing and um, started out traditional, but uh, the more that we read and get exposed to, um, in my experience, I've um, found um, permission and uh, kind of the freedom to take on more difficult family um, stories um, through more of an experimental or hybrid approach to writing. So I'm always looking for a new lens or a new perspective um, to, to explore um, part of that experience um, in my family systems. Um, and I would agree with um, Hallie that there's a lot of stuff that we just urgently feel we need to continue to explore and we find ourselves writing about again and again from different perspectives or different settings or different forms. I think for me, form is very, very important, um, the shape of things. And in this year of the pandemic and Zoom, boxes are really um, becoming a form that I, I want to explore a lot. Um, I think both because um, there's a, a feeling of a connection on the screen and being all together, but it's still such a separation and fragmentation and my family experience in large part um, this year has been even more fragmentation as opposed to reaching out and staying connected. Um, so again, I just, I just wanted to chime in there that I think that um, craft is important and we learn craft um, in very many ways, but one of the reasons I'm interested in craft and rules of writing is because I want to break them. Um, and um, I, I think for particular kinds of storytelling, um, the, the form is what I really have to figure out first and then the storytelling becomes art building um, as opposed to trying to just um, get words on a page. Mm -hmm. And I think form too, as that kind of um, almost way of like recycling. Um, and I don't even know if recycling, because I feel like when, you know, to use the term recycling almost makes it sound like, you know, we threw this away and then we found another use for it, right? And I, I think that's just kind of a, you know, a waste production model approach to writing or our personal content that is like not actually like, you know, these, this material is inexhaustible, right? This energy that we have, these interpersonal connections, you know, the life that we are living is sort of like, 
I think that this is kind of, again, going to back to Hallie's comment, right, about like working through the same thing. It's like sort of the, the challenges that we face in family systems, right, in domestic spaces. And I, I kind of maybe want to get a little bit more into the domestic space too, because I think that has really nice connections across all of your work. And also then this particular inflection at this point in the pandemic, right, since all of us, maybe some of us are finding ourselves more domestic than others, right? Um, this idea of form and, and craft as a way to um, continue existing in this tension, right? And to continue refining what the meaning of these things are to us in a way that we ultimately feel empowered by, right? In a way that we're ultimately able to move through. Um, so I think maybe to kind of, unless again, somebody would like to interrupt me and um, again, please feel free. Um, you know, I am kind of curious what like everybody's conception of the domestic is at this point, right? Um, I, I think mean, that- I'd like to yeah, interrupt Steffi, you. Yeah, please um, interrupt me, thank yeah. you. Uh, so thinking about the way I write and um, I write a lot of familial interactions in my creative, non uh, creative nonfiction. And um, I spent a lot of my life observing things happening um, and there's always a lot of noise and there's always a lot of tension. And I use, I lean heavily on like the acoustics of a sentence to show that. Um, so it, it like feels more intense and there's lots of things happening, even if, um, you know, there might be not a lot of things happening on the page, but like the reader feels like something is, um, you know, happening. Um, yeah. Which I think is, I want to turn it to Sandra too, yeah. Go ahead. I, I was just going to echo, you know, sometimes I will change a word in a sentence and someone will ask me, well, why did you do that? And it's, and it's because of the rhythm. It's, you know, it just has a certain cadence that I like better. And I don't know how you develop that. I think every human has stories to tell and they have things that they should share with people, but not all of them can write it down. And for some reason, we feel compelled to write it down. We, we feel compelled to put it in words on a page. And I don't know if it's a genetic deformity or, or what, what creates that need, but um, most people I have found who write because they have to. And um, I'm unusual because I waited until I retired before I started writing novels and I published my first novel at 68 and now the second one just came out. I've got two more in the pipeline and I just feel like I'm getting started. And, um, and it's, there's so much to say after a lifetime of watching so many patients, so many people, patients and doctors and all the people in between. And it just feels like I can't even get it all out. It's, it's a great feeling. Yeah, I think it, that connects really nicely to, to kind of Steffi's comments about observation, right? And like thinking about this writing as then this sort of consolidation of material, right? Um, a selection of material. Um, if anybody, yeah, Carol, go. And then I'll just say quickly for anybody in the uh, room, again, any questions or chats, please post them. Carol, sorry. No, just the, the concept of, um... I had taken a class once with a teacher and he always talked about, um, you know, there's a core about which like all of our writing orbits and it's this indefinable thing. It's, it's something you cannot exactly put into a thesis statement, but it's there and it's clear. And we may be telling the same story 20 different ways, but we're telling but we're, we're, we're orbiting around the same core. And I think that these core issues aren't just necessarily issues that we might have or even have from childhood. I do think that they are larger than that. I think they're issues that exist in our family systems, but they're issues that can exist like epigenetically. There's issues that can exist like generational trauma through societal trauma. That I mean, these issues that we're orbiting around can be much larger than we are as individuals. And I think that Sandra put it really well, you know, like she, did, she doesn't know like why some people just have to write or are good at writing or what have you. They just do. But I, I feel like if you have the facility for language and you have this sort of sense, I don't, I, I don't like, 
the concept of compulsion, but like the sense of like, I have something to say, I have to say it. I feel like it might be something slightly larger than just the individual you that's making you say it or that you want to say. Um, but that said, I still think we're all learning, um, especially trying to create a larger canon and a larger tradition where like more voices can say things in more ways, if that makes sense. I was really excited by the way that Leah had mentioned, you know, she's drawn to like new forms and hybrid forms and things like that. And I know that she wrote a piece about profound, you know, like traumatic bereavement um, when this started. And I thought like, yes, you need, you almost need to tell a story like that the way she told it, which is, has this sort of like a linearity to it that has these, these pieces, these broken numbered pieces to it, um, where it's a mosaic because that's sort of how grief is, you know? So there's the mixture of the form and the content really married together well, I thought in her opening piece. And I think we're all working on, on ways of doing that maybe. Yeah. I'm talking, I swear. I, no, I liked it a lot. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess maybe like, I, I guess one of the things I'm interested in maybe to like ask another question or to kind of shift directions just a touch, um, to, is to kind of go back to this idea of the domestic, right? Um, and I really, really liked, um, how Steffi put it, right? As sort of the domestic as maybe a space where there's a lot of tension and a lot of noise, right? And it seems like there's not a lot that's happening there, but there is, right? There's so much sort of history and sort of thinking about the domestic as the space of family systems too, which is sort of language that we've used, right? And I think, you know, the family system as the unit of society, right? As the thing that is mediating between the individual and the larger society in which they exist. And so I, I guess I'm kind of like curious just what um, everyone's thoughts on the domestic might be, um, you know, especially in, in the representation of your work, um, you know, like um, what the domestic traditionally being characterized as kind of a feminine space, right? Um, but then like how you sort of um, even maybe existed in that during the pandemic, right? Um, since you are now in this domestic space, presumably you are staying at home, right? Um, what are the effects of that? Um, you know, do you feel empowered by a domestic space? Do you feel that there are things that are oppressive about the domestic space? Um, sort of how are you navigating that, right? Um, both in your work and your writing process. Um, Jake, I, I can jump in. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting, I, I feel really butted up against the domestic, uh, mostly because despite being a cancer um, sign, um, astrology sign, um, and I'm supposed to be good at domestic stuff. I, I'm a huge failure in that. And it's a theme that I've explored a lot of what does home mean? What does housekeeping mean? Um, those kinds of things. But in particularly this year, I've moved back to the valley and my mom lives here and, and with my brother. And as soon as the pandemic hit and we were supposed to be staying at home and taking these precautions. I got a phone call from or a text from my brother saying that um, they had bed bugs. And so there was this like huge domestic conflict of I was over there every day for two to three months um, with extensive treatments and cleaning. There were some hoarding issues and it was this kind of ironic thing. You, you couldn't go out into the world, but she really actually did need to leave her house at one point to have treatments. Um, and she hadn't left her, she's got some phobia issues. She hadn't left her house, you know, in quite a while. And so feeling like trapped in a home that's kind of unsafe or has a um, kind of a malicious visitor. And, um, but the opportunity that that gave me was to, to, visit and hold and touch a lot of um, detritus and memories and pictures and things I didn't know even existed because I had to go through every last piece of paper um, in her bedroom. 
Um, and so it kind of tying into the, even the first question, again, I have this other new perspective about some things. Oh, well, that, that kind of explains this part of her life or what I perceived. Um, um, so in many ways, it's um, been a gift and all I can do is think about wanting to write about different aspects of what I have found um, um, during this time um, with her. And, and um, I guess the last thing I'll say is that she had been canceling my visits repeatedly since I moved back. I was seeing her maybe once every three months and all of a sudden I'm spending every day with her. Um, so it was, it's just a very strange space to have found myself in, um, but it, it still feels like a gift, um, especially in terms of revisiting stories and um, understanding and writing towards compassion, which is what I try to do. I love that. Thank you, Leah. Rather than just talking until someone else interrupts me, I'm just being quiet for a second. Steffi. I, I like to take a stab at that question. Um, I haven't, I've never really thought about my work as domestic until I heard it come up in one of my workshops. Um, and that's because there's too much violence and too much tension in my work for it to be domestic. It's domestic some more, um, it's, it's a quieter word um, and I don't like, yes, my creative nonfiction takes place in kitchens a lot, uh, but there's a lot of chopping going on in the kitchen. There's like cutting and the words that are being exchanged also cut. Um, and uh, with, you know, writing a story that takes place in the kitchen and writing like Chinese American narrators, um that are female uh there is like the tension between tradition and you know what the narrator wants to do um and yeah traditionally she's supposed to be good in the kitchen but she is torn about wanting to be that for her family and you know torn between like knowing outside of the kitchen she's more than this but also in the kitchen this is a place where she can bond with her family and that's how I'm using the kitchen. Um, yeah, and I like using kitchens because it's it's a small space and there's so much going on um, and it's it feels even tighter and uh, it creates more tension when there's like not enough space for people to be angry at each other, you know? Mm -hmm. And there are knives. There are a lot of knives in the kitchen. Hopefully that's the only place you have knives in the house, right? As far as like, you know, maybe there's a cover over it. Hallie, did you want to comment? I feel like you were starting well, to say something. I, as you're talking, um, and I was listening to, to Leah and thinking how brave you are to talk about your personal experience and realizing that I am not brave in that way at all. Um, I don't want to reveal anything real, anything that can be traced to a person or a date, or a, or a real location. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I'm writing about all those things, but at a different layer. And just the whole thing about how, maybe it's the difference between memoir and fiction. I just, I don't think so though. I think it's, maybe other people have a reaction that, do you have to, hmm. I don't even know what the question is. Made me think so. Uh, I can try to address the domestic question or um, I, I will say uh, like I, you know, with everything going on, I think the biggest shift for me in terms of my conception of um, the domestic is just having grown up and having uh, homes and houses you know, both mine, the one I grew up in and sort of my neighbors and my cousins and family who grew up, like they were just such permeable spaces. And that includes not just sort of locally, um, but I mean, transnationally, there, there was just so much constant movement uh, for my family and for relatives and for people I know. I mean, my, my conception of the domestic is really like it spans the border and it spans the entire, you know, northern of Mexico and southwest U.S. because 
there were con- like with, with Steffi, there was always noise. There was always little kids and cousins and aunts and uncles coming and going um, and staying. And, you know, you got to sleep on the floor now or you're going to have to share a bedroom uh, with this person for, you know, a month or so. And, um, you know, there so there wasn't, I don't know, everything now just feels, I think like with most, the observation a lot of people have made this, the pandemic has kind of just accelerated processes that were already in place. And um, for me, being the, the the child of two immigrants, part of that process that's been accelerated feels like is the distancing of the motherland. Like we just can't trap, we can't go back and forth as much as we used to. So it just feels like that border gets more and more imposing, right? It gets, yeah, just more fixed off, more walled off. And um, with good reason, we, you know, just have to be conscious of where and when we're entering um, and what we might potentially be carrying. And, and that is something that I have found to be really difficult um, to adapt to and, and to think about that. Um, you know, my mom uh, and dad, like, don't lock their house, right? They wouldn't lock their doors ever. And just like people would, co- we, you know, kids would come and go from the park. We'd come and go all over all the time. And like, that's just not the case for the the, the generation younger than me of, uh, you know, the children and my ne- uh, the children and my cousins and my nephews and niece and stuff. Carol, yeah. I know that that just it struck me because it's it's so interesting um, with Oscar, like, and his family sort of having like a an imposed border between where they live, you know. And I'm trying to think about well, how would the domestic relate to what I write? And I, I think for me, it's almost the border is time, where um, you know I come from a slightly odd world. Um, I, all of, I, I'm only just 42, but all of my grandparents were born, you know, in the 1800s. I was raised by very, very old people who were raised by very, very old people. Um, and, uh, the house that, you know, we lived in had burnt down before there was like digital photography and, you know, that kind of memorabilia, things like that. Most of the people who raised me growing up ha- have passed on, and even my youngest sibling passed on in the pandemic just a couple months ago. So from I grew up in a house of nine people. For the last 12, 13 years, I've lived alone. So the domestic for me is the borderland is almost in memory where like there's this space that was over full and controlled not by me by people from different places with different ideas, different things shaping them, their own different neuroses, you know, dreams, the things they were obsessed with. And then now it's like my domestic is me and of course like the dogs I'm starting to accumulate. Um, And I don't know, it feels like that the borderland is like time and I'm trying to go back and forth through time um, to connect with, with, with different things throughout my lineage. Um, and the pandemic, I think, has highlighted that because if you live alone, obviously, you know, you go out a lot, you connect with your friends a lot, you're, you're engaged in your community, and now you have to do that virtually. So I think that that, for me, has just, um, you know, become just more sharply, um, just I've been more aware of it. Um, since the pandemic. I don't think it's changed my writing process, but it definitely has changed like sort of my living process or awareness um, and just my relationship with time as a border rather than place. Yeah, it's super interesting too. And I kind of want to point to Sheila's comment in the chat as well, just for something to us kind of consider in the last ish of this panel of this I, somebody what the rambling answer right we could call it that too uh, but I think panels like the more uh, piper term because um, I, I feel like you know there are this term domestic and I, I really am loving kind of the things that Steffi's saying too right as like you know what is the value of the term domestic right it's often used as this way of kind of disparaging or sort of you know assuming this place of tranquility right which is like I, I, if, if you were so lucky to live in a tranquil domestic space, great. Um, but then also domestic in the sense of like domestic versus foreign, right? Domestic versus import. And the way then that this pandemic specifically is also, you know, affecting borders, is affecting migration policy, right? Which we saw, you know, the, the crisis is being used as um, a way to 
uh, take action, right, on certain things. And so I think that these are um, things that, you know, the system was sort of working for. Yeah, Sheila's comment too, domestic versus workplace. Sheila, would you like to talk? We can give you like the ability. I think it would be great to, to have your voice if you'd like to. Um, please do feel free to um, ask a question. Sure. Um, Carolyn, Carol has been my teacher and my editor. And so, hi, Carol. Hi, <laughs> Um, and it seems to me that the, what I said is, is domicile versus workplace, that um, we have a whole category of domestic. And if you, it, it seems it means less and less and less the more you take it apart. Because um, Carol and I had to read Fitzgerald together once. Oh, God. <laughs> and uh, just, it's just going perseverating, perseverating on and on and on, all these little tiny gestures and things behind the gestures and, and so close, you felt like you were two inches away from everything he was talking about. Is that domestic? Because it's close? I don't think so. I'm, I, I'm very, I'm with Stephanie and everybody else who wants to expand, who wants to drop the term and think more about um, <clears throat> how we cover different parts of our experience, who's, which parts of our experience the world is more, I think the world's more comfortable looking at your traditional domestic scenes. It's been in literature for a long, long time. But looking at the scenes that we find ourselves in through other academic disciplines, through other ways of thinking, through other places, that's newer. So I, I think, you know, the domestic versus um, professional, I think it's going to go away. Yeah. Sorry, somebody said something. Oh, no, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, I think the, the stereotype thought of domestic is the housewife, you know, and, you know, kind of you think of a 50s sitcom with the family, that sort of thing. But maybe it's just the realm I come from, but Stephanie's I, realm is very much domestic to me because I come from a world where the term domestic violence is extremely real. And uh, it's and probably used more in that context than any other context. And so I, I think that it's a very loaded word and almost to the point where it starts to lose its meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tally, yeah. Yeah, and in, in crime fiction, it has a whole different meaning, completely different meaning than any, that what I think what you're talking about. In, in crime fiction, we talk about the difference between a thriller which it might be a political story or, or a, uh, a pathogen released uh, and we have to stop it from spreading or, or uh, uh, military or, or uh, uh, spies. It's got, they're, they're big stakes, high, what they call high concept books. And then there are the domestic books and, and uh, um, Gone Girl is, is an example of one of the first in that genre that just sparked so many followers on. And these are all stories about individual people's relationships with other people to whom they're connected domestically. And within that, the setting is more likely to be a house than uh, the Rue de Rivoli. I mean, it's, it's, it's this contained setting relationships and the stakes are not world pandemic. The stakes are trust. Who are you going to trust? Who's going to betray you? Is the person that you depend most upon the one that's going to betray you? That's, that's the meat and potatoes of, of domestic suspense. And, and I mean, that's what I write. Um, it's, it's not, it, it, it's about the scope and the scale and the, and the characters and, and, and themes. I, I would also add, um, literarily speaking, um, because so much in the U.S., at least English and actually Spanish language fiction has been dominated by um, the upper class. Uh, I think about the characters in the domestic who are invisibilized, domestic workers, the groundskeeper. And, and I bring that up again, because if you've been near the Southwest, um, in Arizona, in Southern California, we know exactly who those people are. You know exactly what they look like, 
what they sound like. And so even that, the idea of their, the domestic being a workplace for someone else, right? Being the source of labor exploitation, frankly, yeah. for a whole class of, of people who raise the children of others, who maintain the homes of others. Um, and it's so institutionalized and how, you know, whether it's in Garcia Marquez or in the US, right? Like thinking about giving, you know, talk, we talk about the different stories contained, right? Think about uh, centering stories and narratives of those perspectives as well. Um, and, and what kinds of possibilities exist for characters who otherwise are relegated to literal margins uh, or just background, you know, unvoiced uh, roles within these larger dramas that play out. Um, I think Garcia Lorca's play, you know, La Casa de Verdad de Alba yeah. um, comes to mind, but yeah. Right. I also think um, like for me, Roma came to mind as maybe a, a contemporary example that's maybe doing some of this work as well. Right. Um, and I think too, that's doing it in a way that is, um, you know, I think the challenge for the writer then as, as the sort of wielder of craft, right, is to sort of incorporate that tension, right, so that this doesn't become sort of simply like a oh, you know, let's show the hardworking person who like still has like, find so much meaning in other things. It's like, no, 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 right? Like we're not focused on the individual hero's journey, right? Like the home, the family, the domestic, which you have traditionally used, right? You, the larger society to erase the labor of others, right? To sort of essentially remove class consciousness, right? The domestic is actually a space where these macro systems, where this power like erupts, right? Um, and so how can then that be engaged with in the work itself, right? So that it's not simply the, the individual, but the system itself, the tension of that system um, that the work grapples with, right? Which I think in, in a lot of ways, all of your work is, is doing really beautifully, right? Is sort of trying to live in that tension of um, the home and maybe some of the things that we're doing now too, right? Um, maybe. <laughs> Any final thoughts from, from panelists, from folks? Sheila, thank you so much for that um, question as well. I'm going to sort of trim the panel a little bit. Um, closing thoughts? Just some gratitude then. Thank you guys so much uh, for thank this you. conversation. Um, the way it took its turn, really lovely um, thing. I think that um, especially will kind of give all of us some things to continue to think about both in our own work, but also as we're kind of continuing to do the work in our homes, right? Um, whatever those homes might be. And, and to really, I think, be thinking very critically too about um, what is going to happen, right? Um, so again, thank you so much to all of our panelists, all of our readers today. Um, it's just really great to get to spend some time with you. Please do uh, keep an eye out for Hallie and Carol at the Desert Nights Rising Stars Virtual Writers Conference. Early registration ends December 31st. There's schedule, there's faculty, there's a lot of people. It's all on our website. Um, we'll be sending a, a survey out through the RSVP portal so you can tell us how we did, anything that we can do to improve, what else you might be interested in seeing. Um, as always, the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing is here to serve. Um, let us know how we can serve you. So. Um, thank you, Hallie. I'm just going to run through everybody's first names. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Steffi. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Jake. Thank, thank you, you so much. Cool. Have Stay a wonderful night, everyone. everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you.